So good morning. And that was a very nice introduction. I do want to say that the two people who preceded me are serious pioneers and seriously important leaders, and I think they deserve a gigantic round of applause. Um, our, my topic today is the climate coalition in the Trump era. So let me just give you the, our full mission statement at NextGen, which is to act politically to prevent climate disaster, promote prosperity, and protect the fundamental rights of every American. So that, <laughs> and let me say we're all, I, at, I hope to have time for question and answers, so as not to leave me standing here with my uh, jaw hanging. If you could think up some really softball, easy questions for me, that would be fantastic. <laughs> but we are here to talk about clean energy um, and sustainable business, but I want to start by talking about cell phones. Back in the 1980s, AT&T asked McKinsey, so the leading American consulting firm, to estimate how many people would be using cell phones by the end of the century, so approximately 12 years later. They estimated 900,000 cell phones at the end of the century. And of course, by 2000, the developed world had half a billion cell phones. So they were off by over 500x. And why would I bring this up? It's because when people think about disruptive change in the world, they think incrementally. But actually, disruptive change is disruptive. And so it happens in a much more significant way. What Don is talking about takes off in a way that people have never, could never understand. So last year, I partnered, over the last two years, I partnered with Mike Bloomberg and Hank Paulson to look at the role of the private sector in our transition to a sustainable, clean economy. And we spent a lot of time and money on research, and we published it in two reports called the Risky Business Reports. And we said that based on existing technology, America could achieve an 80% reduction in emissions using com commercial or near commercial technology. And people thought of that as a important finding in the sense that this was something that we could do and we showed that in fact it would make us richer, it would make us healthier, more jobs, better paying jobs, lower costs. And we estimated that in California, Washington, and Oregon, the transition would lead to $17 billion in additional GDP by 2030 and 131,000 new jobs. Last year in California, we created more than 40,000 new jobs in clean energy. If you think about it, we, we were saying for over 14 years we would create 130,000 jobs. In one year, in one of the states, we created 40,000. Our numbers were ridiculously <laughs> wrong. We were talking about our current path. We were saying not to deal with this would be expensive. We were saying if we don't deal with this, intense storms would raise the cost by $108 billion per year in uh, between now and 2050. Of course, Hurricane Harvey alone is going to cost Houston $180 billion this year. We're going to spend $350 billion this year on climate-related disasters. That is a huge problem, way more than people are willing to admit, way more than anybody estimated. When we looked at the numbers, people have more than doubled how much the sea is going to rise in this century. So everybody's been wrong, both in terms of how big the opportunity is from a business standpoint and how big the cost is of not acting here. So let's talk for one second about what the overall strategy is. The strategy is pretty simple. The strategy is clean up electricity generation, electrify everything, reduce our energy usage. So we've seen these costs come down dramatically. We've seen wind and rooftop solar go down by 70% since the early days of Obama. We've seen battery costs go down by 73%. We've seen utility scale, scale solar prices down by 80%. And the point that everybody in California should know is once you get on these cost decline curves, they don't change. We keep going down. It is not like, okay, we've made these reductions and that's the end. The fact of the matter is we're going to see 
continued increasing cost reductions. The lines have crossed. We're in a disruptive place. There's no reason for us ever to build another fossil fuel plant in the United States of America. And it's also true, just so you can feel good about yourselves, something that we've spent a lot of time trying to get people to do, which is not own oil and gas stocks, to put pressure on these companies to admit that these are dying industries. This is the worst performing industry on a stock market basis for the last quarter, year, three years, five years, 40 years. The people who are fighting to keep it in their portfolios are just fighting to be poorer. It has cost them about a percent, which if you think about it, it's not that, you know, say, say it's 10%. It is costing them a percent on their whole portfolio to do the wrong thing. So it, it's, it's just hard to understand exactly why people are fighting their ass off to lose money. And particularly because we haven't gotten to the point where people realize that actually these companies are liquidations, not ongoing businesses. That is going to happen, and I really hope that you don't own those stocks when people make that transition intellectually. The other thing that's true is Tesla is more valuable than any of the big three auto companies. GM couldn't understand why they had such a low valuation. They said they were going all electric and the valuation spiked. I don't know if you guys have been following this, but it's like, come into the new world, please. And the last thing I'll say is, there, the argument against clean tech was always job-killing energy tax. Job-killing energy tax. We know all of the studies, every piece of information, every actual research says more jobs, higher wages, lower costs. They were lying. And I think now we just got back some studies, some polling data from purple states, not from California, but from Midwestern states saying about over 70% of Americans realize that's true now. So their go-to move job killing energy tax is something that is in the ash can of history, which is exactly where it belongs. <laughs> but I think we've also got to, you know, one of the things we've got to understand about this is people like to believe there's such a thing as the free market that there's this thing that was divined by God and set down on earth, and that's what runs things. And that is a fallacy. There is no market in this world that is quote unquote free. Every market has rules. The simplest market in the world has a time when it's gonna open. It has organization about who gets what stalls. It has times when it's gonna close. It has rules. Trust me, energy markets have tons and tons of rules. So policy really matters and energy policy forever has made a huge difference to what we actually do. If you think about the American development, the railroads, wildly subsidized by the federal government, the highway system and what that meant, paid for by the federal government, the microchip, the research for the internet done by the federal government. So when you think about the free market and all the arguments that people make about, you know, just let the market work, Understand every market, including specifically the employment market, has rules that determine how people can compete. And certainly the energy market, when you think about the delivery of energy to people's houses, the delivery of energy to people's commercial enterprises, is totally dominated by rules. So when we think about how we got here, remember, the Obama administration, the state of California, have passed regulations and rules to support the development so those lines could cross. They didn't just cross. If we'd been talking about these costs per kilowatt hour in 1980 when people wanted to go solar, the costs were entirely different. So they spent money on R&D. They set up loan programs for early stage green energy companies. We've had tax credits to incent hybrid and electric vehicles. We've had regulations on how much, you know, how businesses and buildings can use energy. So that has enabled us, that the basic rule for solar is every time the installed base doubles, the price goes down 24%. So it's also true that if you look state by state, there's a huge variation. Since 19, since 2000, Texas has reduced its emissions by 1.4%. Regulation really matters. 
We, and that's important because we now have a group of people in Washington who are trying to pass rules that go the exact wrong way. Rick Perry has, a, it has proposed a rule that you have to use cola nuclear, regardless of cost, even if it's more expensive, which of course it is, they want you to have to dispatch that for political reasons. This is a guy who used to say that he didn't want the federal government picking winners and losers. Here he's actually trying to turn losers into winners by law. But th what this points out is we don't have a technological problem anymore. We don't have a market problem anymore. This is just a political problem at this point. And so it is really important that if we're going to make this happen, we're going to have to win politically. And I want to just talk quickly about what California says about winning politically. <laughs> We've known since 2010 the No on 23 campaign. We know two things. It takes a coalition, environmentalists, labor, healthcare, public health advocates, communities of color, progressive businesses. We have to have that coalition. This is not won by environmentalists alone. If you look at the reauthorization of, of cap and trade this year in California, there was a huge coalition that included environmental groups, communities of color, the agricultural industry, and the Western States Petroleum Association. What happened here, we have to have a coalition, and this bill was partnered with a clean air bill about particulate pollution in poor communities and for poor kids. We would never have gotten cap and trade if it weren't, if it weren't coupled with an old-fashioned pollution bill aimed at the places where we put our pollution, which is poor communities and communities of color. And the bill was led by a Latina legislator from a very poor part of Los Angeles who was determined that that clean air bill, along they, she knew darn well how, how greenhouse gases work. But the fact of the matter is, when we look at this, we need a broad-based coalition. Latinos are the people who are most sensitive on the environment, clean air, greenhouse gases, everything. Number two, African Americans. Number three, Asian Americans. So when we want a coalition, we need a broad coalition in the state of California, if we're going to win, and across the United States of America. And that means talking about health and jobs. If we aren't talking about creating millions of net, good paying, organized jobs, we don't win. If we're not talking about clean air for poor kids and poor communities, we're not gonna win. When we think about where we're standing politically, about greenhouse gases, saving the world, the opportunities that we have for businesses, if we're not ha talking from the standpoint of a just of justice for people in the United States, for opportunity for people in the United States to use this as a central plank for how we get back to a more equitable, fair country, we're not going to win. And we shouldn't win. Because this is right in the heart of who we are, what we stand for, and if we don't include it on the message, and we don't have that coalition, then what we are is going to be a siloed, individual, policy measure that doesn't hit the local human lives of the people of this state and the people of this country, and we will not win. They want me to take questions. <laughs> and I will, but let me say, yeah, go ahead. I know you've also put a lot of uh, time and, and your money into cleaning up the White House. <laughs> um, could you just say a couple of words how, how that mission is going? <laughs> well, I, the basic thesis that is partly dealing with our climate crisis is that we're in a broad-based crisis in the United States, and I think that I mean, I can talk about it in terms of climate, that if we don't act on this during these four years, we're actually looking at, I mean, you guys all know what these fires look like. They're not. That's our future. So we're actually, in, in, in terms of two nuclear confrontations that we've created, 
the climate crisis that we can solve, but we must solve. We have, I feel like we're dealing with the health and safety of every American. I also feel like we're in a huge democratic crisis in the sense that I believe that there's a deliberate, concerted attempt to subvert our democracy and that it's going on on an organized basis to take away people's rights, whether those are African American rights to vote, whether it is the rights to organize, whether it's immigrant rights, whether it's LGBTQ rights. The fact of the matter is I could keep going. So I feel, and I also feel as if this president has clearly met the basis for impeachment. And I feel as if, <laughs> I honestly believe that we are at risk as a country, but also as just as communities and human beings. And I don't exactly understand why our Democratic elected officials aren't standing up and saying that. I've se we've seen four Republicans, George Bush, John McCain, Senator Corker, and Senator Flake, basically say he's unfit within the last week. Ex and extremely clearly and extremely forcefully. And the question is, and we're trying to say, the only thing we know how to do, our organization is a grassroots organization. You know, last year with our partners, we knocked on 12 and a half million doors. We were on 370 college campuses. We registered 807,000 people in the state of California. We registered 450,000 people outside the state of California. The only thing we need to, we know how to do is go to the American people and say, raise your voice. I, we believe that if the American people raise their voices, we win because nobody can resist us. And that's, so we aren't really going to the elected officials. We're saying, American people, tell these people how you feel because if you do, they have no choice but to listen because they really care because they're worried about their jobs. If everybody says, this is my thing, it will happen. And that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> sir. Tom. Oh, oh. Okay, go ahead. Just talk. Uh, this is a potentially controversial question. I don't know. Um, I lead Swing Left Marin in here, which is about all about you know flipping the house. And I agree with you that it's about policy and it's grassroots. I also lead a group that put on a coalition building conference, Rock the Congress, which was about bringing all the different groups who are trying to do what you're doing to flip the house and really affect change. And and I was just at a meeting last night where we're all saying, how do we inspire our friends to get active? How do we get more people? There is so much work to do to do what you're doing. We don't have deep pockets. We're just like the little guys, you know, here meeting in our living room. And we're all struggling with how do we get people to uprise? How do we get everybody to be inconvenienced, to go out and knock on all the doors that have to be knocked on across the country to make what has to happen happen? Okay, so that is a great question. How do we organize? because there's a lot of strong feeling, but strong feeling just doesn't get it done. In, you know, in politics, what gets it done is organization and showing up. And so what I would say is this, in the state of California, and maybe we should be doing this together, we have 65 local partners. And whether that is PICO, our, our biggest local partner is the African American Registration, Engagement, and Participation Project in LA. And, but we have partners in every single county, and our goal is to register the people who are underrepresented, which means young people and people of color. And our goal is broadest democracy, best democracy, but we know that it takes resources to enable those organizations to hire people, train people, and send them out to have the conversation with other citizens, because that's what we actually believe in. We believe that when Americans talk to Americans about what they care about, about the issues of the day, economic justice, fairness, environmental justice, climate, race and ethnicity, schools, they get involved and they vote. And if, we've, if the people of America vote, we win. If the people of America don't believe in the system and don't show up, we lose. So what our goal is to use to partner with local groups so they can do their job of getting out into the communities 
more effectively and we try and have goals and monitor it so if it's not working we can adjust but the basic goal is if someone's going to knock on your door if you recognize them as part of your community and have a conversation with them you're much more likely to understand what's at stake you're much more, more likely to show up at the polls and if everybody shows up at the polls we win that's how it, that's how it works Tom, thank you very much for being here. If you were to invite all of us to your house for dinner, and you could w look be at very each- Very crowded. And, and, and uh, it would be a party in the streets. And you could look at each of us in the eye. What three very specific requests would you make of each of us? So you'd take the 250 people here and turn us into 1,000. What would you do that each of us could do at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the three months that would make a huge difference? Okay, so, so this is, I take this as a question of what are the things that are set up to do that people can do? The first thing is, if you haven't done it, I would really appreciate it if you'd go on to www.needtoimpeach.com. <laughs> And we have gotten, I don't think we've said publicly, but we've gotten hundreds of thousands per day of people signing up, www.needtoimpeach.com, and get your friends to do it, because we need, we actually need that kind of, the second thing I'd say is, any thing that you can do in terms of being part of an organization that is involved is important. And whether it means, you can go on our website and call your, Congressperson, one of the things that's going to come up for sure is this tax cut for rich people that they're trying to pass off as tax reform. So if you look at the health plan that the Republicans proposed and couldn't pass, it actually was all about a tax cut for rich people paid for by a reduction of health care for working Americans. But it was really, the, they didn't want to throw 32 million people out of health care. No one, they're not crazy. They wanted a tax cut for rich people, and the way they could pay for that was throwing 32 million people off of health care. This, this is a straightforward, the analysis by a nonpartisan group who we talked to said it starts in the first year, 53% of the benefit goes to the top 1%, and by year 10, it's 80% of the benefit goes to the top 1%. This is not tax reform. This is the payoff for their donors. So they are gonna try hard to do this. And I think it's gonna be really important that you're at, the second thing I do is, it is really important to make your voice heard on this, because this is a crime. Because this is the Texas two-step. The first step is, we cut the taxes. The second step is, oh my God, the budget just blew up, now we need to cut services. And if you ask me the number one thing we need to do in the United States right now, it's invest in the American people. Their budget is, cut education. I would say we need more money for education. Their budget is cut health care. I think we need better health care for Americans. We need better training. They actually cut, and Albert, you should know this, they cut school lunch for poor kids as a non-essential. So any parent knows, really, lunch is a non-essential for poor kids. Because if you're not getting lunch, guess what else you're not getting? Breakfast and dinner. So the idea that we would take away a kid's right to eat at lunch is insane, particularly when they're taking that money and putting it into new weapon systems, into new prisons, all the command and control things that they think makes a powerful nation. But that isn't what makes a powerful nation. What makes a powerful nation is well-educated, well-trained, productive, healthy citizens. <laughs> And the, thir the third thing is, I would say, whatever you can do to incent voting, not just vote yourself, but get everyone else to understand, that is going to be critical. You know, in 2014, we had the lowest voting since 1942. And in 1942, I don't know how many million Americans were overseas, but they weren't voting. 
So when we look at what happened, including in California, this is all about do people believe our system works? We talk a lot. We're on 370 college campuses. Those kids are knowledgeable, they're idealistic, they don't believe the system works for them, they don't like the parties, they don't believe the parties are serving them or are responsive. We need to break that. A democracy does not work if people don't participate. And it's pretty clear in most of these states. Right now, there's gonna be a huge election on November 7, 2017, so like 14 or 15 days from now, less, 10, governor of Virginia and all the state offices, they do an off-off-year election. And in Virginia, just so you know how it works, basically if 44% of the people vote, 44 out of 100 registered voters, Democrats win. If 42 or less vote, Republicans win. It's really about do people think it's important enough to show up? And in that case, we're looking, and I don't know if you guys have followed this, they have basically been running very ads very similar to the Willie Horton ads of 1988, extremely overt racist ads based about Latinos in this case, which are honestly shocking if, if you were to see them. And they're an attempt to fire up the Steve Bannon, Donald Trump wing of the Republican Party after they had that horrible confrontation in Charlottesville where somebody got killed. That's where we are in the United States in 2017. So it's a, it, this is an extremely clear fight over values and for the heart and soul of the American people. And if we don't have a positive alternative that's talking about how we're gonna have a better future, not that we're not Trump, not that we're not Bannon, not that we're not Nazis, but we also don't have two heads. We don't define ourselves by people who don't have two heads. Who are we? And I would say it is important for us to all recognize we stand up for the rights of every American, we invest in Americans, and we will build a clean, sustainable country for everybody. And if we have those three things, if you thought about just those three things, then we could get up in the morning and say to people in rural America, to people in forgotten parts of America, this is a future together that is much brighter and that's a traditional American thing to do is have a vision of the future and make it happen together. I know, I'll, 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 I'll be quick. Two more questions. Um, two first more of questions. all, I just wanna say I'm a humongous fan and I'm so, I feel so honored just to be here today. So thank you for, uh, for coming to speak to I'm us blushing. today. Yeah, good. Um, and second of all, I've never um, been more inspired about this opportunity that we have um, because wearing my perpetually rose colored glasses, I've never seen people be so angry and activated and fired up. And so um, my question for you is, are you running? <laughs> <laughs> so here, what I've said, people think that I'm being cute, but actually I'm not being cute. I am try I view us as being in this desperate situation. I really do. And I feel as if not winning in this, if you think about the three things that I thought were so key, protecting people's rights at huge risk if we don't win. Building a sustainable America, really? These are people who are trying to mandate the use of coal. And investing in people, you can look at the budget that was proposed and in every single instance where something goes to either human beings or research, they've cut it. Every single instance. And every single instance that has to do with a command and control philosophy, they've grown it. They put $54 billion more into the military. They didn't even know where it was gonna go. So in terms of what I'm thinking, I will do, you know, I was, I, I've been trying to climb the 14,000 foot peaks in California. There are 15 of them. I've climbed 10 of them. And I'm really not that great a climber, to be honest. So I was looking at something that I'd climbed, it was, and we'd come down like 1,000 feet, and it was very jagged and steep. So I was extremely happy to be done. And the guy who I was climbing with said, what would I have to pay you to go back up that? And I said, there is nothing you could pay me 
You, if you offered me a million dollars, I would not try and go up that. I, no way. I'm so not interested in that. He said, if we solve the climate crisis, would you do it? <laughs> I said, in bare feet. <laughs> and that's my answer about running. It, I'm really just asking, what can I do to make a difference? Because I feel like for all the people in this room, this is our chance as Americans best chance ever to make a difference. And that's what I'm for. So one more question, please. One more question. Hey, look, it's the guy from YouTube. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I was just wondering, because like politics is something we get really fired up about, right? Like, it's us against them. What are some things that we can do? And especially, what are some things that young people like us can do to potentially convince people from the other side to join our cause without necessarily being nasty or taking like making our side assume the moral high ground? What, how can we like negotiate our so, opinion? Well, I really break it down. I think that's a great question, maybe the question. And I really break it down between American citizens and elected officials. Because I think that the American citizens in 2016, regardless of where they were on the political spectrum, were sending a message which was saying, you are not paying attention to us. This country is changing really, really fast. I mean, we're in Northern California. So we're kind of at the epicenter of part of that revolution, the information technology part of that revolution. But there's a globalization revolution going on really, really, really fast. The climate is changing much faster than anybody expected. And Americans, regardless of political orientation or party, feel like the world is spinning fast and often spinning away from them. We're kind of riding the wave a little bit here, because we're in NorCal. But imagine if all of us were in Akron, Ohio, or rural Wisconsin. Americans want to work really hard. We're the hardest working people in the world. But if we felt like even if we worked really hard, it wouldn't work for us, that we can't work hard in this new world, that this world is changing so fast, and we're not computer scientists. So when I think about what we're talking about, that is something that is specifically relevant to those people, too. And I feel like having that message is inclusive and listening to them and understanding why they would feel so insecure and scared, why they would feel so left out, is just listening to decent Americans. And I understand that part. The part that I am very, very judgmental about is if people put their careers ahead of the American people. I really, really, really resent it. And that's what I think we're seeing. Because I think to ask, to ask the country to go back to coal is just wrong, and it's cynically wrong. I think appealing to people to try and divide them and exacerbate race worries is a crime. That's a more, in the United States of America, with our race history, to do that is unthinkable. It's just wrong, and I will not excuse it. And I think there's a series of things where they, you know, I always make a joke about climate and a politician. A politician says, the end of the world or my mediocre career. The end of the world's not that bad. It's like, no, you have to make the moral judgment here on these issues. And we're at a place of, I think we're in extreme peril, so people have got to make the right choice. And I, so for the American people, we should be extremely open. Our hearts should be open. Our minds should be open to listen and make sure we're responding. But for cynical politicians who are going to put their careers and their donors' interests ahead of the American people, you think about that tax cut. You think about the idea of throwing those people off health care for a tax cut for rich people and rich corporations. That's not right. And so I'm extremely sensitive and sympathetic to American people, and I'm extremely unsympathetic and angry that people would put their careers ahead of the safety and health of Americans and morality. It just, so I really distinguish about the people and the electeds. And we have to go right to the people and make them insist that we do the right thing. That is how America will solve itself. 
more democracy, more people, and morality. That's where we are. Thank you, Tom. Wonderful. Thank you. Great job. Thank you.